can you trust the radial artery pressure? 78 year old man undergoing aortic valve replacement. This is the femoral in red and the radial in pink. Blood pressure. Note these are the uh, somatic uh, saturation, which are normal. After cardiopulmonary bypass, uh, the somatic saturation are still normal, but the systolic pressure is 48 millimeter higher than the radial artery pressure. 61 year old man undergoing uh, mitral valve replacement with uh, coronary revascularization. This is the femoral in red, the radial in pink. And uh, after bypass, there is a 78 millimeter gradient between uh, the femoral and the radial. In this case, the brain saturation is even higher than before bypass. Remember, before after bypass. You have a 78 millimeter systolic and a 33 millimeter mean pressure difference. So can you really trust a radial artery pressure monitor? This is a much more serious problem that it might look like. This is my plan for this. In 1985, Stern also asked the question, can we trust the direct radial artery pressure immediately following cardiopulmonary bypass? This was the first study in 18 cardiac surgical patients where the radial and the aortic pressure were noted before and after bypass. In 13 out of 18 patients, 72% of patients, there was a significant gradient between 12 and 32 millimeter of mercury. The gradient was attributed to resistance of the forearm. The author concludes that radial artery pressure does not accurately reflect central aortic pressure in the immediate post-bypass period. The reports of this phenomenon were reported uh, and published in 1987 from Israel, 1989 from uh, uh, North Carolina and the United States, 1994 from Belgium, and in 2013 from Florida, USA, just to name a few. In 2009, we published with my colleague Alain Deschamps this article showing a patient after mitral valve surgery. Those are the femoral and the uh, radial artery pressure. Note the systolic uh, gradient of uh, 46 mm of mercury. Our conclusion was that early recognition of an abnormal extensive aortic to radial arterial pressure gradient is the first and most important step in excluding intraoperative hemodynamic instability as a cause of persistent hypotension in cardiac surgery. In 2016, we published our first prospective study on this topic. We defined significant uh, radial to femoral arterial pressure gradient as a systolic femoral above or equal to 25 mm of mercury compared to the radial artery pressure or a mean femoral artery pressure from the femoral above or equal to 10 mm of mercury of the mean radial artery pressure, which lasts at least five minutes. In that study, we measured both the femoral and the aortic pressure before and after bypass, and there were no differences. A significant radial to femoral arterial pressure gradient appeared initially just before bypass, at the end of bypass, 5, 10, 20, 40 minutes, and upon sternal closure. The prevalence of this gradient was 45%. On univariate analysis, small weight, height, 
and body surface area were associated with the gradient. Higher risk score and more complex procedures but also small, small radial artery and longer aortic clamping time were associated with a significant radial to femoral arterial pressure gradient. However, on multivariate analysis, only the height, the personnel score, and the aortic clamping time were significant factors. In 2018, we report a much, lar a much larger retrospective study that included 435 patients. The prevalence was 34%. Consequence of the radial to femoral arterial pressure gradient was that those patients with a gradient at longer hospital stay and a tendency for a higher mortality. The most important risk factor were again a small body surface area and a longer clamping time, but also the fluid balance and hypertension were important risk factors. The study was followed by an editorial who raised four points. First, they mentioned that this was only a retrospective and observational study. They asked also, we didn't clarify when did it occur. Was it before, during, or after bypass? There was no electronic recording. And finally, so what? What's the clinical impact of monitoring both the radial and the femoral artery pressure? This is our most uh, recent uh, study on this uh, topic which uh, answers uh, most of the issue raised by the uh, previous editorial that I mentioned. The primary objective of the study was to determine if pre-op radial artery diameter could help predict the occurrence of the radial femoral pressure gradient using continuous electronic recording of both the radial and the femoral pressure. And we used the same definition as for a significant radial to femoral pressure gradient. Secondary objectives were to quantify the prevalence and the duration of the radial to femoral pressure gradient, and also to compare vasopressure use in patients with or without simultaneous radial and femoral catheter in the operating room and using an additional validation cohort in the intensive care unit. We included cardiac surgical patients with radial artery diameter measurements on both arms. They were done using a surface ultrasound. And also we had electronic recording of intraoperative blood pressure data. A total of 129 patients were recruited. 37 patients had only a radial artery catheter for their surgery and 92 or 71% at both a radial and a femoral artery pressure catheter. We had a total of 78,013 blood pressure data points on the electronic record. In patients who had a small radial artery uh, diameter less than 1.8 millimeter, 48.3% had a significant radial to femoral arterial pressure gradient. Diameters between 1.8 to 2.2 was associated with 33% uh, of uh, radial to femoral artery pressure gradient. And those more than 2.2 mm had only 22% of uh, significant radial to femoral arterial pressure gradient. Patients with a smaller, smaller uh, red, uh, a radial artery diameter less than 1.8 uh, millimeter had a longer duration of the radial to femoral arterial pressure gradient more than one hour than those who had a radial artery diameter more than 2.2 millimeter. On the y-axis you have the radial to femoral area gradient and on the x-axis the mean blood pressure gradient the total before, during, and after cardiopulmonary bypass. In green, the radial artery more than 2.2 mm, red 1.8 to 2.2, and blue smaller than 1.8 mm. Those are the mean gradients in patients with the radial artery diameter more than 2.2 mm. 
millimeter, in red 1.8 to 2.2, and in blue the highest gradient observed with radial artery diameter less than 1.8 millimeter. Note that they tend to occur more commonly during cardiopulmonary bypass. So the overall prevalence was 34.8%, basically the same as our retrospective study, with an overall duration close to one hour, and they would occur mostly during cardiopulmonary bypass. In some case, the gradient would be present throughout all the surgery. In white is the mean femoral and in green the mean radial artery pressure. In some patients, it was only during bypass. Only in other patients, the gradient would appear only after bypass. What was the impact of using both the radial and the femoral versus the radial artery pressure monitor alone. So there was 37 patients in which we used the radial versus the radial and femoral in 92 patients. Those with a radial and femoral artery catheter had a much longer cardiopulmonary and clamping time. They had much more complex procedure and more common difficult separation from bypass. However, they required less phenylephrine than the radial group and they used the same amount of noradrenaline. In the validation group, we had 40 patients with a radial versus 109 patients with a radial and femoral pressure. The patient, again, with the radial and femoral pressure had a longer clamping time, more complex procedures, but they also required less intraoperative phenylephrine but the same amount of intraoperative noradrenaline, vasopressin, and epinephrine. They had the same ICU outcome. However, the duration of vasoactive drug in the ICU was shorter in the patient with the radial and femoral artery pressure than those with only a radial artery pressure monitor. So when you have pseudo-radial pressure hypotension. How can you suspect this in your patients? The first is just to measure non-invasively your arterial pressure in the upper regions. This is a 70-year-old man with diabetes, vascular disease, known abdominal aortic aneurysm with hypotension and abdominal pain. This patient was rushed in the ICU and the operating room is getting ready. When he arrived in the intensive care unit, he didn't look that bad. He was talking. The blood pressure on the left arm was 80 millimeter of mercury and the radial was exactly uh, the same, but on the right arm, it was 130 millimeter of mercury. So we examined the abdomen with ultrasound and this is what we saw. There was a distend and fill stomach, most likely from diabetic gastroparesis. This is the second bucket of fluid of a total of two liters that was removed, and the chest X-ray uh, was not as diagnostic, however, as the ultrasound examination. So the patient was rushed out of the ICU and the operating room was canceled. In a study by Frank in anesthesiology in 1991, systolic pressure difference between arms more than 20 mm of mercury are present in 21% of patients with peripheral vascular disease versus 3% in coronary artery disease, and systolic pressure difference between arms more than equal above or equal to 45 mm of mercury are present in 10% of patients with peripheral vascular disease. This is a multi-center prospective study where we compare non-invasive blood pressure and the radial to femoral arterial pressure gradient in ICU patients.
81 ICU patients uh, with visoactive uh, agents and uh, radial and femoral catheter were recruited. A significant radial femoral arterial pressure gradient occurred in 15 patients with a prevalence of 18.5%. A non-invasive mean arterial pressure gradient of 11 mm mercury between the non-invasive brachial pressure and the radial pressure had a uh, area under the curve of 0.93, a sensitivity of 92%, and a sensitivity of 100% to detect a significant radial to femoral arterial pressure gradient. Another technique to detect a gradient is the use of brain monitoring. Editorial in 2018 where we ask, can you really target an optimal blood pressure with a radial artery catheter? So this another advantage of using NIRS is the following. This is a 60-year-old man before coronary revascularization. There is no significant difference between the radial and the femoral artery pressure. This patient has normal brain saturation. These are the hemodynamic data during surgery. During cardiopulmonary bypass, this is the evolution of the femoral artery pressure and the radial artery pressure. During bypass, a significant gradient appeared between the femoral and the radial. However, the brain saturation remained normal despite a mean radial artery pressure of 29 mm per of mercury. In addition, the transcranial Doppler was also completely normal during that time period. If you are still using a radial artery catheter, this is another tip that you can use with 2D ultrasound of the art using a mitral regurgitation pressure grip. So this is a 54-year-old man with infected aortitis. This patient is highly unstable in the ICU. He has a radial artery pressure catheter, which indicates a pressure of 110 over 67. He has a mitral regurgitation, but the pressure gradient is 165 millimeter of mercury and there are no aortic stenosis. This indicates that the radial artery pressure is unreliable. This patient was on uh, adrenaline, vasopressin, amiodarone and noradrenaline. So the adrenaline was completely stopped and uh, the uh, atrial fibrillation just resolved as uh, uh, the patient, uh, we stopped the adrenaline, she w he went into a, a sinus rhythm, and then we could stop the amiodarone. So again, the same way as a tricuspid regurgitation gives you an estimation of your pulmonary artery systolic pressure, mitral regurgitation pressure gradient gives you an estimation of your systolic left ventricular pressure, which should be equal to the aortic pressure. Finally, to the ultrasound of the radial artery, as we discussed, but also pulse wave brachial Doppler ultrasound can be useful to uh, detect a unreliable radial artery pressure. Radial artery reliability can be evaluated before arterial cannulation. These are the normal triphasic Doppler waveform of the subclavian, the brachial, and the radial artery. If you have subclavian stenosis, you lose the diastolic reversal. Do we check if there is a subclavian stenosis before we insert a radial line? Just using a simple linear probe and Doppler you could know right away in less than 30 seconds if that artery will be reliable to be monitored. You could say, well, let's use routine femoral catheter. Well, if a patient has vascular disease with iliac and femoral artery stenosis, would that be a good idea? 
and the ICU a few weeks ago had three patients in which there was a failure to insert both the right and the left femoral artery catheter. This is a color Doppler of the femoral artery. Look at the irregular pattern with an obstructing plaque. You would not use a femoral artery catheter in this patient. This is the normal arterial Doppler velocity. Note the reversal diastolic wave. This is the femoral Doppler velocity of one of that patient. There is no reversal. Instead of blindly poking a femoral artery, why don't we perform 2D and Doppler before and decide if this will be a safe and reliable place to put a arterial catheter. Over the years that I practice in the intensive care unit, I can tell you that radial to femoral arterial pressure gradient can occur in any critically ill patient. Those are examples of patients with acute abdomen, acute hemothorax, thoracic empyema, and gastric viruses. In conclusion, radial to femoral arterial pressure gradient occur in what, up to one-third of cardiac surgical patients and last close to one hour. They are more frequent in patients with radial artery diameter less than 1.8 mm and longer cardiopulmonary bypass duration. The use of radial and femoral artery pressure monitoring in cardiac surgery is associated with reduced intraoperative vasopressors and shorter duration of vasoactive agents in the ICU compared to the use of a single radial artery pressure monitor. Radial to femoral arterial pressure gradient can occur in any hemodynamically unstable patient. All arteries used to monitor pressure should be routinely examined with 2D ultrasound and Doppler. In cardiac surgery, we do not recommend the use of a single radial artery monitoring. Thank you for your invitation and attention.